Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say that if I look different from the poster that you got, I'm sorry, I've become ugly become after two years of PhD student. <laughs> that picture was taken actually like two, uh, three years ago, like 2011. We was in Shanghai. We was very handsome. Right now, it doesn't. So today, I'm going to talk about the carbon spheres. And why I call this grape like carbon uh, nanomaterials for uh, high performance specific capacitors. So, in the future, if you add grapes, you might think about, oh, jumps work in this area. Okay? So, I want to special mention that uh, the co authors, uh, Bhutan, Kelsey, and Boris, please stand up in, the, in that direction. They are very talented scientists. <laughs> And my research goes to right now because of them, because they have so much and because they are support, so I'm very really to have. But actually, uh, only one person can stand here, so that's how I came here. You, you guys sit there, don't come here. So I want to briefly introduce my pathway, like how I become here. So this is the map of China, right? You know that. So I born was here, I born in Jiangsu, south of China, a province. And then, I moved to Northwest University for Nationalities, major in chemical engineering, which is, you, you can see from, from, the, from the picture. And then I moved back to Shanghai for a master in already in chemical engineering. So you may, might wonder why John can do science in material science, because his background in chemical engineering. How can you do that? Let me tell you, anything is possible. Don't stop dreaming, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then I choose US. Why? Because all of you guys are so nice, and US has very developed science. So I choose US as my uh, abroad destination. I take the plane, you see? You see the kids? <laughs> I take the plane to Philadelphia. And so I have a PhD in, finally in materials, chemistry engineering. So it's not material science, it's in materials, chemical engineering. It's kind of absorbed, but, but actually it's a major. So you may wonder, see? Okay, so China, US, what's the next? You may wonder, what, where's my next degree? Let me tell you, the entire universe. I don't know where should I go, planets, which planet I should go back. Don't stop dreaming, okay? If I can go in such huge step, maybe in another planet, I will study for like postdoc, postdoc, or post postdoc something, I don't know. <laughs> so, today I'm talking about nanotiers, um, talking about nanotiers, basically highly related to the application. If you take out, take out of your cell phone, disassemble it, you will notice a battery was there. And even if you go further, you disassemble your battery, you will notice it's cathode and anode was there. But I highly recommend you don't do that because your cell phone will die if you are not a specialist. So this is the iPhone 5S. And you disassemble it, you will notice the battery was there. And then disassemble the battery, you will notice that there's a cathode and anode. Usually, the anode is the graphite. The cathode is the lithium intercalation compound. So the mechanism is that lithium ions must go into means intercalation and the integration into the graphite. So this is charge and discharge. So you may not notice what is going on in cell, but actually this is science. This is highly related to our daily life science. So in, except the uh, lithium copper component, or uh, lithium copper intercalation compound, there we also have lithium iron phosphate, titanium disulfate, and vanadium oxide. Those are all <coughs> of the cathode material, but they are insulated. So the anode, so the anode material is usually the graphite. The commercial materials is graphite. So you may wonder where is the graphite? Actually, it's, it's everywhere. Take out your pencil. So the thing that in the pencil being writing is graphite. So it's conductive. If you don't read, try it. Try it, okay? Try it. It's conductive. So, but, all, but right now we already have a lot of challenges. Take a look at this picture. The computer may someday die or catch fire on fire in the airplane last year event in, in the Japan's airplane uh, corporation. They have the issues that the uh, uh, the Boeing 787 have the problem and they cannot take off because of the battery problem. So this is the challenge of lithium ion batteries. And also, and also, if you take this picture from one twelve to 
stream for 47, it takes a long time to finish the charging. You may not be happy with that. And the reason is that intermination process or diffusion control or the large initial resistance and the chemical reaction kinetics. So those are from the chemical kinetics problem to explain why it is not charged so fast. And also, we have the short lifespan. If you use, like, after one year, your cell phone maybe die, and you can even charge for a whole day, it cannot be charged fully, okay? So this have that problem. So that's why I came to my research, supercapacitors. You may wonder, what is the meaning of the supercapacitor? What's the meaning of the super? We all, we all already know that capacitor is two uh, parallel press, and then we still charge. Through, uh, on, on the press, but this is highly limited by the area of the press, right? So that's why we call it supercapacitors. Why? Because of material. Material is simple. How is super so large? Because so the charge, this charge, in a couple of seconds, it's very, very charge, instead of a couple of hours or a couple of days for charge. And safety, long cycle life, and, and the high energy density. So this is all the merits of supercapacitors. And you may wonder, what does it look like? Okay, this is what it looks like. So in parallel, like four supercapacitors in series or in parallel, so again, if we December one of them, we notice that this has the separator and the uh, positive electrodes and negative electrodes. So if we December further, we may notice that the, the electrodes is composed of the nanopartures, uh, highly porous. So the ions when charging, negative ions and positive uh, uh, cations and ions will go to the electrodes circuit area and then we discharge the ions we go back to the bulk of the electrolyte. So and and we want a high specific area so that we are correspond to more higher capacitors. So that's what we are working on. So and also we have a lot of applications already. See these pictures. The first picture you will see the cars. Here is in I take the picture from Shanghai. Uh, they already commercialized the EDLC, uh, the electric car, the hybrid electric car. And during, if you guys go to, went to the Shanghai uh, World Exposition uh, on 20 term, you will notice that the car you take is exactly the uh, EDLC car. And this is based on supercapacitor, especially the car materials is a supercapacitor. So, and also we can use the Boeing, uh, like Airbus, Airbus here, an electric car. And this is hybrid electric car, camera, and all of that. So, in order to make to uh, have a general idea of how it works, I would like to show you a videos uh, if you have patience. How to make it into a transfer of another one? Sorry, because I have another window. This is a capacitor inside the car. See? The empower rate, a lot of the empower rate. So this is a frequency converter. And this is my models. Enjoy the electric converted into the more energy. So when we break it, we uh, arrive at the station, we break it so that the uh, move energy converted into electric energy and store in the speed capacitor.
Yeah, finally we arrived at the station. <laughs> so we charge right now, see what is happens. The, the, the gas, the platform rise, and we become charging the process, start the charge. So the electric. And then it lowers down to finish charging and start to run again. So that's it. Hold it back, sorry. So here, so just right now, it is a general idea how it works. Now, become science, it like this, the ions, so we're charging it. The ions go to directly into the positive and negative perspective with the cations and ions. You want to see that again? That's it. So the uh, voltage was up and the ions become like that. So, Today I want to talk about carbon materials. Carbon materials have a lot of carbon materials, uh, active carbon, nanotube, graphene, all of this you might be very, very familiar. And those, I want a special uh, emphasis that zero dimension and two dimension is fluorine and graph graphene. For those, we already got Nobel Prize. So we are pretty excited to work in this area because it already have some very successful examples in academic career. Uh, maybe someday. Uh, Another thing, I don't know what's the name, we have got a Nobel Prize again. So, probably, don't stop dreaming. Um, so, you may say why is carbon materials for civic capacitors? Uh, it's very high surface area. If you guys play soccer, you may notice that uh, one gram of the active carbon, which has our specific area over 2500, that it equals to the one gram of active carbon in surface area because the football field, so it's very large. And also, it has good conductivity. And uh, have very strong nanotube, graphene, and carbon and fiber. So that's why a lot of carbon spheres. So today I want to spend a uh, while talking uh, more about um, carbon spheres. So the carbon spheres prepared, this figure is produced by Kelsey. So we first do uh, using the emulsion polymerization uh, and use the liquid uh, ammonia as catalyst to a resource node and formaldehyde using the emotional polymerization to become poly organic polymers. And then the carbonization activation becomes highly porous, the carbon spheres. So this is the mechanism of how we prepare the material. So if you want to uh, know more on the mechanism, today I want to uh, talk about more here because this is more science. If you can look on the uh, reference, this explains very good. I like this paper so much. The mechanism Basically, it's uh, droplets formation and polymerization and cross-link into space. So, if you look at uh, the SEM, you will notice actually our material is carbon spheres. So, this is a proof. This is carbon spheres like football, uh, like, like, like the grips. And TEM, you will notice that after activation and before activation, it has become highly porous from C to D, become highly porous after CO2 activation. So, this is the SEM, it, it looks like. It has a lot of the uh, bore-like uh, spheres, and we call it grip-like carbon spheres because highly related to like, this picture. See? I promise in the future, if you look at the grips, you will be think about the carbon spheres with spheres capacitors. So, here is the more special data, a bit faster, because it has a little bit of damage. <coughs> so, the porosity, so we want to determine the power volume of the uh, carbon spheres, and the uh, uh, surface areas, right? So we have to determine the properties. So we use a lot of techniques. 
nitrogen absorption desorption, so we determine how, how large the pore size is and uh, how large is the surface areas. And then determine, like this is the number, just look at the number. Usually we have worth uh, 15 hundreds numbers, but right now we have 29 hundreds. See here, 20, 29 hundreds, usually we have 15 hundred. So it's pretty high. And the texture prop, uh, texture uh, carbon spheres, we have D peak in, and G peak. And this indicates that it's amorphous, but a little bit older the graphic, graphic structure. And from the raw uh, inspector, so we have after activation, the ID activation improves huge, so which means we highly improve the disordered carbon structure. And from here, we after activation, the peak move to higher temperature, which means the graphite structure become much, much older. So, and texture problems here is related to the last picture, here this picture, and this is amorphous, so this is XRD data. If you guys are working on the materials, this means highly amorphous carbon spheres has been prepared. And this surface groups, so the surface functional groups are this before activation, we have the, this peak is very huge, which means this is CO double bonded, and this CO single bonded. And you see both of them, uh, the intensity decrease huge. So which means after activation, uh, the uh, surface function groups reduce dramatically. And this is the remaining structures that we use in NERD, uh, the organ to treat, to remove the surface area, uh, surface function groups away. To, and also we can use this method to, to determine the content of the surface area, uh, surface groups. And so you, you here we find the carbonization temperature, high temperature we have less because it, uh, the mass decreases less. So the function groups is less in content. So, in, so our material in conclusion is very dispersed and high surface area, power volume is 1.3 which is also very high and it's enriched in functional groups and also the narrow pH, uh, pore size distribution is very suitable for the supercapacitor capacitor application. Now, so, uh, so that's what we are testing as a supercapacitor application. We have to determine the, the electrochemical performance. So in <coughs> electrochemistry, we always use at least three techniques. This is what uh, cycling photometry, so we call CV. CV is rectangular, so we calculate the capacitance from this area. And if this shape, we calculate from this area, the integration. And the second technique is called governor static charge discharge. So when you charge your cell phone, it means governor static charge discharge. And we calculate the capacitance from this slope, and then we use the, this slope uh, to calculate the capacitance. And also, we can use the uh, EIS, which is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, to determine the inner resistance of your material. So after we got this, so this is uh, just showing the data, rectangular, so we can calculate the capacitance from this area, and we compare the different materials at the, uh, prepared at different conditions, which means we can compare which conditions is better and which conditions produce better results for, uh, for capacitance and smaller resistance. So here, compare the resistance, we definitely find which is better, which is very apparent, right? So this is cycle life. So a cycle, 5,000 cycles, you still can definitely not cycle so long time. This cycle, very long time, 5,000. And after 5,000, the capacitance is still 95% of the initial, which means the capacitor not die. That's not die, right? It's very easy to understand. And then I compare the activation, different uh, the activation temperatures effect on the capacitance. So this is chart, this is chart. This is how you see you chart yourself for behavior. And this com this compare comparison of the uh, uh, capacitance, the material and this resistance. So always you we use the three technique. CV and the charge discharge and EIS to evaluate the material you prepare is suitable or not for the supercapacitor application. So it's very easy to understand. And also, if we test in different electrolytes, organic, ionic liquids, and so this is comparison in total, in summary. So in aqueous uh, sulfuric acid, we have the higher capacitors, and in organic, we have better rate performance because from lower to higher, it, uh, the capacitors almost keep like 98 or 95 percent, so which means it can go faster, right? And this is energy density power density. This is very useful for a real device. 
if the energy density is very low, then you charge. Can you after charge, you see your computer die immediately because energy is very low. And if the power density is very low, then you can it take a long time to finish the charge. If the power density is very high, then you can finish your charging process in a couple of seconds. And I will just show you. So here at one like at one hundred meters per second, the capacitance is one hundred ten farad and this takes only nine seconds to finish the charging. What about in what about in organic? So in organic, because we have better weight performance, we charge faster. One volts, one thousand volts per millivolts per second, and we got the capacitance in eight uh, seventy eight farad per gram, and it only takes two point five seconds to finish the charging. How do you imagine that? In the future, you still have to finish charging in a couple of seconds. You can hardly imagine that because right now, I've even iPhone five S. It takes at least one hour to finish the charging. This is annoying, especially if you want to have some emergency stuff to do and it suddenly have no power at all. So this is really so this is a comparison. It is a battery and it's super faster. So the power density and the density of materials in this area, we just care because right now the current situation is we are running this range. So we have higher energy density than the, than the current material. So we just care. And so we also compare to the commercial uh, active cover. We notice that the area is large for our material, which means high capacitance, as I showed you before. And this is comparison in different electrolytes, different materials. We also notice that. Our material is better than commercial YB50 uh, active carbon. Now, also in this electrolyte, sodium so, uh, uh, um, sulfur acid is better than the sodium sulfate, which is also which have optimized the better uh, system for work, for normal working. Now, so this is the final page. This is the final page of the PPT. So, since our carbon spheres have a lot of applications, uh, works so. Good in our supercapacitor. We want to seek you guys working in another, another area. We want to collaborate with you. So if so, this is actually a potential application. So carbon spheres goes goes beyond the DLC. Why? So the lithium sulfur batteries. We can use the, uh, the carbon spheres to produce the lithium sulfur battery, and also we can use as a catalyst support to de to deposit the metal oxide or metals. Nano, nano particles on the carbon spheres and then use as a fuel cell catalyst to generate the power and the electricity. And also we can use a drug delivery. Some of you might be working on the drug delivery or the polymers. So we can think this is also carbon spheres can be applied in that area. And also we can use in uh, chromatography, which is very useful for the absorption because it has high uh, absorption uh, uh, properties. So we can use in this area. And also we can use the mask. So in your lab, you definitely find the mask, right? So inside it is active, active cover. So anything who, which has a higher surface area can use as a mask app, uh, application. And also this data, this thing is produced by uh, Kelsey. Things, things so loud. So this can be used for flow capacitor. This figure is pretty beautiful here. Yeah. So this goes to my final. Uh, I want to thank my group members, Dean and I, and Professor Bossi. I enjoy working there. And also, I enjoy, I really appreciate you guys can come and give me support. So that's my conclusions. It goes like this. Thank you. However, the energy density, as I mentioned, energy density determines how long you can use it. 
and the power density determines how fast it can be charged with this charge. So this is totally different. So right now, the entire community are working on the supercapacitors. It's devoted, dedicated to improve energy density, so that's we can last longer. How we can incorporate in the redox capacitors, which is use the reaction uh, chemical energy, chemical energy in a story. So we can deposit the metal oxide. That's what I'm working on to improve the energy density. So deposit the metal oxide or the using the conductive polymers or uh, doping some uh, functional groups. So use the electrochemical reaction and to store more energy. And this will last longer than sex very faster. So this is very good question. For uh, Damiana, um, would a device on a network with these adaptive antennas that doesn't have this technology, so something current, would it be able to save energy on this network to use less power? Yes. Uh, developing some sort of power harvesting system, you mean? Well, the, the, to save energy, like, we would be able to transmit maybe at a lower energy because the antennas on the router were um, more efficient? Ah, yes, yes, definitely. So, um, so regarding the wireless access point uh, technology, if you use a configurable antennas, you can definitely um, you can yes, you can definitely use less power to achieve uh, the same uh, or even better uh, connection performance with respect to a conventional static antenna. Um, the energy uh, the energy concept is a concern also in terms of wearable applications because. Uh, uh, we, we believe that uh, in addition to, um, to wearable technologies that enable to measure uh, fitness activity, biomedical monitoring, in the future we will be able also uh, to keep our garment, our clothes, with a power harvesting system. So you can, let's say, uh, charge your phone inside the pocket of your, of your jacket. We are currently working with a group of uh, students and they are working on the development of a, bio, of a textile power harvesting system. They, the goal is to collect energy from the surrounding uh, wireless uh, access points, store the energy and uh, uh, release the energy to charge the phone or some other handheld device. Okay, any other questions? So. Yes. I have a question for Damiana. So, um, actually, for both of you, regarding your future research and, and maybe continuing to um, focus on bringing in other disciplines and, and people from other fields, um, especially in Damiana's presentation, do you see yourself maybe working for Nike and helping design like the next brand of like running software that people can wear that's you know fashionable but also tracks their performance? Do you think you have a, a future there? I mean, I strongly believe that wearable application is definitely um, is definitely a technology that uh, will grow very fast, uh, and many companies are investing money on this technology. And honestly, I would really like to. Um, I really hope that we will have the chance to commercialize what we are currently developing. Because uh, the technologies that we are developing in our lab is, uh, is very interesting, and uh, if I can, if I can like be the founder of my own company that build this kind of uh, this kind of wearable technologies, uh, that would be great. And how about for John? How do you see your work, you know, with developing these uh, technologies in, in the future? Where you First, you have to give me money. If I have money, <laughs> then everything will be much easier. Then the second, the second thing is that if I we have, suppose we have money, then I think the leadership will be much, much more important. We don't want to invest any technology like based in some uh, bad management and uh, you know something like that. So the third thing comes in the technology, technology itself. We have to update our technology because right now the, the, the it's updates so quickly. Some even the technology right now seems working and seems promising, but in the future, uh, like a couple of years later, it may not working quite well. So we have to catch the opportunity, 
uh, in updated of technology in, and fix some problem. Uh, right now, let, let, let me give you an example. Like if we notice the cycle life in our technology in, in this uh, synthesis or in this application is not very useful. But if we publish papers, we can say, okay, it's acceptable, but in realistic, we cannot do that because in 95% after 5,000 cycles for supercapacitors, it's not very desirable. In, in real life, we have to cycle millions of tons and still keep 98%. But in paper, we can do that. In the paper, we can, okay, compare to other paper published, we can say after 5,000 cycles, it still keep 95%, which is good. In reality, no, we cannot. So that's why we have to update our technology. We have to rethink the uh, methodology or methodology or the process. Is this perfect? Is this something we could still improve? That's the question. And that we can keep our technology alive and keep our technology still useful to the market. I think that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Comments on interdisciplinary research? How many people are doing interdisciplinary research now? How many people want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I saw a question here. Yeah, I have a question or comment. Uh, does Apple using the same uh, uh, technology for adaptive antenna? Is it from here or something? I know that their new routers they use the same thing that it can detect the device. It sends a signal directly to the device. Yeah. Is it something from Drexel or...? So, yeah, um, currently um, there are some products already in the market, uh, some wireless access point uh, that integrate the computer of the technology. But unfortunately, they tend to be very bulky and big. Uh, they don't have a very nice form factor because most of the time they have a 3D structure of the antenna. They have an horizontal and a vertical uh, component to build this kind of antennas. What we are, what Adant, the company that I mentioned in my slide, is doing right now, is trying to uh, bring the technology, the reconfigurable Niki Wave antenna that you have seen in my, one of the two antennas that you have seen in my presentation, to bring this kind of device uh, um, to the actual uh, market of wireless communications. And in fact, now they are working with many uh, companies in the Silicon Valley area that develop wireless access point in order to integrate this technology in their products. Okay, uh, so I think we've uh, reached our time, so let's thank our speakers again. And, uh, <laughs>